Moving on, um, the next one in line is our third speaker of this session, and he's here already, um, and I'm very happy and pleased to um, welcome my dear friend Sam Doubly here. Sam is working for human rights um, organization Amnesty International, and that Amnesty, he's the head of the evidence lab at the Crisis Response Program, always a difficult one. So he's a very experienced human rights investigator. And a part of this is also that he heads the so-called Digital Verification Corps, which again is a collaboration among law schools um, from all over the world that also work collaboratively on uh, detecting human rights abuses. By the way, they also use Truly Media for that. Um, and he's done so much else. For example, very recently he published, or co no, he was a co-editor of a book which he kindly gave me, a very good read, really must read, um, which is called Digital Witness, Using Open Source Information for Human Rights. So it combines articles from a variety of authors on very different techniques, as they were also described just earlier by Hazel and by Sophie. And he's had a life previous to his human rights work. He namely worked for the EBU, the European Broadcasting unions. Uh, he's also a journalist by training, so he brings that together as well. And he's now going to talk about what all this means from a human rights perspective. And I know there's lots of similarities to journalistic work, but there's also a few differences in what they're focused on, on and what really matters to the work of, human, of a human rights investigator when it comes to using tools. And we've mentioned things like archiving, location, and also Oh, all the other. So he's going to talk about that and share his insights. And I'm very happy and glad to have him here with us. Over to you, Sam. The floor is yours. And go ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jochen. And thanks to everybody at the We, <clears throat> we Verify and, and Invid team. I can only echo um, what H both Hazel and Sophie said about Invid being one of the most indispensable tools that we use pretty much on, on a day to day basis. Um, and really thank you very much, Hazel and, and Sophie, um, for, for your presentations. And I think in some ways I'm very privileged because I, uh, uh, having had um, Hazel and Sophie lay a bit of the groundwork of some of the, the tools that are used, um, I get the, I get, I'm kind of the lucky one who gets to go into a bit of a, a case study and present some of the challenges that we face uh, through the eyes of a, of a case study. And just to, just to preface it, you know, um, I think we've all probably seen case studies before and so on and so forth and suddenly it makes it look also also easy right it's like oh you did this and then we did that and then we did the other and then blah blah blah, blah. aren't we amazing um so there may be an element of, of that in here because of time and because of the way we have to present case studies but you know hopefully what, I, what i'll try and do is show show some of the challenges and some of the ways we try to approach the problems and hopefully give some people some kind of tips and techniques along the way of, of how we approach the problem um, so what I've what I've called this is, is if everyone can hopefully see my presentation, I uh, get a thumbs up from Jochen. Perfect. Yeah, uh, is, is the idea of confirmation anxiety, and I've called the kind of case study confirmation anxiety and conflict verification. Um, and I think this is where one of the difference between between what the work that Amnesty International does and and so kind of the work that Hazel uh, and Sophie do really comes into play. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of bad things happening in the world. There's a lot of, you know, really important news stories that happen in the world that are covered by Hazel and Sophie's teams that we just ignore because, you know, bad things happening, people dying doesn't mean there's been human rights violations that have occurred, doesn't mean that there's been violations in, of international humanitarian law that have happened. So while there's obviously very regularly a lot of crossover in the work of, of of Reuters, of AFP and of Amnesty. And, you know, we, we, we do collaborate, we talk to each other, we help each other out in many different ways. Um, there's a lot of things like, you know, the what comes out of Donald Trump's mouth, which we've all thankfully forgotten about these days. Uh, what comes out of Donald Trump's mouth doesn't really affect us so much, for example, or, you know, uh, a stampede in a supermarket uh, in Germany doesn't affect us so much. So I think that's where we, we see some of the, ma the major differences. But definitely my, my world of, of working in newsrooms has been kind of somewhat informative and important for the work I do at Amnesty. So what I'm going to focus on uh, is very much this idea of, of confirmation anxiety. And this is kind of where the case study went. And, you know, some might argue we went even too far on this verification exercise. But um, I think it's a kind of in interesting to think about how far you can go and some of the challenges with some of the free tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And why I call it confirmation anxiety is one of the things that Amnesty has definitely been facing a lot recently. 
is in the conflicts that are going on around the world, be it Myanmar, be it protests in Chile, be it um, the wars in Syria and Yemen, whatever we do, we get we get accused by heads of state and heads of government of being purveyors of, of fake news, uh, even when we're right. And um, this has only got worse. This is getting worse and worse and worse with each conflict, with each crisis that emerges. You know, the, the targeting of our researchers, the targeting of, of the teams at Amnesty, and I'm sure this is something experienced also by Reuters and AFP, is just getting worse. We, I've been, I've been, I think this year I've been, paid, I've been paid by Putin, I've been paid by China, I've been paid by George Soros, I've been paid by Mossad. Um, you know, all these accusations kind of fly at us all the time. Um, so this is actually why confirmation anxiety, this idea of like doing verification and asking yourself, am I really right? And getting kind of nervous and, and quite frank, nauseous sometimes uh, when we publish something uh, is getting worse and worse. And this was definitely one of those situations. Um, I'm going to start with the end. And this is a collaboration that we worked on um, that was published in April. With, with CNN and, and Nema El Bagir, uh, the CNN senior international correspondent, who's done a lot of amazing work on the crisis in Tigray in Ethiopia. And I'm, I'm sure most, most of you, many of you are at least familiar with the war that's been going on in Tigray since, since October and the massive humanitarian uh, catastrophe that that is creating, including now we're looking at a, a, definitely a period of famine. Um, in the region, but there's been a whole host of, 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 of war crimes that have definitely been committed in Tigray and, you know, AFP, you know, have been, have been in the vanguard of that. Reuters has been in the vanguard of that. Uh, some of the other AP as well, the news agencies have been in the vanguard of that and doing really important work. And we've, we've been doing what we can there, Sorry, there as well. Yeah. Sorry, Sam, can I interrupt you? Are you sure. moving slides already? I am. Can you not see CNN? Yeah. I'm... No, we still have oh. the introductory slide on the screen. Oh no, that is really frustrating. Okay, why could that? Now be? we've got the I... CNN slide. Now you have the CNN slide. Well, I guess I'll proceed like this, um, which obviously I'm afraid you get not the full glory of my presentation, but I'm not a Zoom user, so um, yeah. There we go. I think we'll just have to proceed like this. This, isn't, this hasn't actually happened to me before, so I wonder what would be the cause. But anyway, I'll, we'll carry on like this in the interest of time. My apologies. Um, so what we have here is, yeah, this, this um, collaboration we did with, with CNN, uh, which was an investigation into a massacre um, in very close to a village called Namberi Dago in, in Ethiopia, where we think around 70 men uh, were taken captive uh, by the Ethiopian army. And executed on this on this mountaintop. All we had, the all we had that emerged was these five videos. And I'm not going to show the videos because they are somewhat somewhat distressing. Um, these five videos that emerged um, in late February, early March um, of this year um, that we kind of set off on a on a challenge on the challenge of of verifying. Uh, there were several challenges here. Number one, telecommunications to the whole Tigray region had been cut. Uh, the, one of the first things the Ethiopian government did in October 2020 when the conflict started was cut the, cut, cut the telecommunications lines. Um, so getting stuff out was, was very hard and also talking to people was very hard. This is why a collaboration on this was, was very, very important because we were unable to travel to Ethiopia. Our Ethiopia researcher uh, who's based in Nairobi um, is, is Ethiopian and there's risk of him actually going to Ethiopia. Uh, and, and getting visas for other members of our team was, was, was proving very hard uh, to, get, to actually get into Ethiopia. So we had these five videos, which came to around seven minutes. And, you know, they are, as I said, very, very distressing. Uh, we ruled out pretty quickly that they weren't faked in any way. They weren't deep faked. Um, you know, we ruled out very quickly using reverse image search that they hadn't appeared online before. Um, um, you know, the, the question of deep fakes and kind of like, yes, having Donald Trump speak or one person speak to a camera, we can, we can construct a deep fake, but constructing this whole scenery with the amount of movement that's going on is still not really technologically possible yet. Um, so this was very juttery footage. We were told that it had been leaked by a whistleblower, uh, uh, an Ethiopian soldier who had, you know, actually changed sides. So what we do is when we kind of confront with this, there's very little to go on, right? There's like five videos we can kind of, we edit them all into one, one stream, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the first things we ever do when we're kind of confronting a geolocation challenge like this is start to create a panorama. 
Um, now we talk about kind of tools and there are lots of tools out there that kind of tell you that you can put your video into this tool and it will suddenly create a panorama out of it. I've never yet found one that works. So maybe that's a project for, for you guys. Uh, so what I do is I tend to take screenshots and drop them. This literally, this is what, you know, you can actually see the sausage as it's made here. Uh, I literally drop them into Keynote and uh, kind of play around with them until we get something of a panorama. And there's lots of gaps here because of the juddering nature of the video. Uh, this is a kind of collection of different videos as well as I tried to piece it all together into one puzzle. This starts to give us an idea of kind of the landscape that this could be, right? There's very clear, uh, there's very a very clear kind of like purposes and, and things like that and, and chipping out parts of, of landscape. I'm not a geographer, sorry, I'm not very good at all. Geography terminology here. Uh, and But it went also, like you know, we had a 360 degree view of one of the scenes, so we could also look backwards, right? And I'm sorry, I've just covered up the corpses there that we see, see in the video. Um, so one of the first things we did in this, in this, um, in this, um, in this um, geolocation exercise was, was use shadows. And, you know, we often talk about shadows as, as helping us look for, um, helping us look for um, the time that something happened. Here we were using it in a slightly different way. Uh, we were using, I was using shadow analysis here to exclude areas that I knew I needed to search for. We'd been, we'd had tip-offs as where, of where this could be, uh, but the tip-offs of the, of the, of the area was uh, pretty large, right? It was like somewhere south of Aksum, which is a, a town, a very famous town in, in Ethiopia. It's where the uh, Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be kept. Um, somewhere south of Aksum, somewhere north of another place. So it was a very large area, right? But what we could see in the, in the satellite image that you see on the right here is that there was lots of kind of flat, high flat lands, which we, is actually something we see in the video. So we're like, okay, it kind of could be roughly here kind of idea. Um, so what we did was uh, looked at the videos and I made, a, I made a, you know, a lot of verification. I think we have to be honest is about making assumptions and trying to prove if those assumptions are right or wrong. So looking at the videos, I made, I made several assumptions. Number one, that this was happening before sunset. Right. It wasn't happening early in the morning, but it was happening somewhat before sunset. You know, we can see that from the light, from from the length of the shadows, that kind of thing. Um, and so so I kind of took uh, the tool called SunCalc. You have the link to SunCalc if you don't know SunCalc at, at the bottom there. Um, and kind of just started kind of looking at the general area, putting the pin in generally anywhere south of Axum, north of the other place whose name I forget right now. Um, and kind of determine, well, if it had happened around six o'clock and we were told it had happened in January, this event had happened in January, if it had happened around uh, four o'clock in the evening, sorry, if it happened around six o'clock, it was already sunset. So we kind of like, we're like, okay, sunset's arriving. So let's save this around. And so let's, let's make an assumption that it happened just before sunset. So around 4 p.m. We should have placed the sun in, in where you see the, the, the orange dot on the, on the right-hand picture there of the two, one's from the, one's from the video, one's from Suncalc. Um, which allowed me to do one thing, right? I kind of said, okay, the sun is was going to be in the in the southwest, with the, so therefore the shadows would be going towards the the northeast somewhat. Um, now I, I spent a long time kind of creating a nice fancy uh, pop up thing here, but now you just see everything at once. Um, now what's what's the use of that? Well, what it could what it allowed me to do was it gave me all these potential locations, right? Uh, and that's still a heck of a lot of locations. Um, but, but at the same time, it allowed me to rule out all, all the places with the crosses, right? There's no way that the people could have been looking that, you know, out towards the north, the northwest, or sorry, the northeast, for example. So I could rule out all of these locations. And yes, that meant it was then a painstaking process of pretty much going to every single location on Google Earth Pro. And let's see, at least this will play, hopefully. And actually, like dropping the little orange person in Google Earth Pro onto the terrain, and we don't have Street View in 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 Tigray, of course, onto the terrain and kind of start to look at all these kind of automatically generated terrains in Google Earth Pro. And you know, the glamour of uh, the glamour of verification obviously tells us that you know, oh, and then just in thirty seconds, I worked this out, and blah blah blah. Actually, three people were working on this for about four days to actually try and find a location, right? So we, we kind of painstakingly went through each of these locations. As you see there, there's one problem. If we look at the videos, for example, you know, you see lots of different uh, hill shapes, right? Uh, which, which, which is due to the light at that time. 
Uh, and that was something we couldn't replicate. We couldn't see from here, right? It all looks something of a blur. We can't see the different uh, makes, the different kind of shapes of the of the of the of the different hills and the different plateaus. So what you can also do in Google Earth Pro, which is quite nice, is it's a bit fiddly, but you can play with the time of day. So you can kind of change the shadows, which then ever so slightly gives you a kind of distinct overview of the different places that this could be. So this is something we also did. And then we finally, through a kind of question of, of, of looking at these different places, having a few estimates of the of the place, of the of where it could be. We I think we got it down to about six that it could be here, could be here, could be there. Um, we then started looking at the videos and seeing what we could see from the satellite imagery that might have been reflected in the videos. Um, so we started looking at the patterns in, in, the, in, the, um, in the foliage, in the landscape, in the geography. And here, you can actually see some very similar patterns, right? It's a bit blurry. You may have to make a kind of a small leap of faith a little bit. Um, but, you know, especially the one circled in red, I think probably everybody looking at this uh, can, can probably work out that mm, that looks about right. You know, that looks about the kind of right kind of place. So we found this spot south to the south of the little village of Maberi Dago that we started really to hone in on. Uh, but still, I had this con con um, confirmation anxiety going on in my head. You know, I knew we'd put out just two months, three, uh, sorry, two to three weeks before uh, a big report on the massacre that happened in December of 20, uh, sorry, late November 2020 in the town of Axum. Uh, and we got, you know, massively, massively attacked on social media for this. So knowing that we were, you know, even though we were working with CNN and they could take some other flack, knowing that this was still a potential and knowing that I was working with a partner, right? It's not even, it wasn't even my reputation we were putting online, it was the reputation of a, of a collaborator as well, potentially, uh, which would be even worse. Imagine that, you know, CNN had to advertise, uh, sorry, I had to apologize on behalf of, of Amnesty International for getting it wrong, you know, that would be like, oof, I couldn't even... Imagine makes my confirmation anxiety come back as I say that. Um, so we had to go a bit further. We had to go a bit further. So kind of really kind of really went into the um, functions of Google Earth Pro to really try to sketch out the different parts of the video. And we started getting somewhere, right? We could see that this kind of fitted together, even though we didn't have the, the range of perspective that we needed, as you see on the right hand side, on the right hand side, for example, where you have the long plateau, right? On Google Earth Pro, you have some peaks in the background, whereas on the video, there's no peaks in the background, right? But we could just about make sure, use it, make out, make, using the kind of shape, changing the time zone, changing the time on the on the on the on Google Earth Pro, that we could just about make out actually those mountains are further in the background, and that in the foreground is a flat area. So we could say, okay, that fits in, and then the shape of the hillside fits in, and we kind of really went into it, except for one part. And there was one part that was just, I could not get out of my head. And this was this part of the video. This was this part of one of the videos where, you know, you see, I've, again, if I was able to show the slides properly, uh, you'd have a nice little drawing of this happening. Uh, but you see how in the video, the, the side of the cliff goes down really dramatically. Whereas in the Google Earth Pro algorithmic reconstruction of the terrain, it's a very soft slope. And I'm always thinking in terms of like, how could we be attacked? How could we be wrong? I was 95% certain that we were in the right place, but there was still this 5% that I really just, in this case, in many instances, I would risk it. You know, an airstrike in Syria where we had 10 different videos of the location, something didn't quite fit. Sure. Protesting in Colombia where, you know, you're not quite 100% certain of the street corner, but you know it's in Cali. Sure. That's kind of okay-ish, especially when you're doing things at scale. But this was one very, very, very discreet, very, very targeted niche verification. So this question, I just could not get out of my head and I wasn't prepared to go on. So we did some digging into actually what's going on in, um, in Google Earth Pro and why this problem was actually uh, generating itself. And so we did some digging, I talked, spoke to a few people and what's going on in Google Earth Pro is that there are, they have what's called a digital elevation model. Uh, so a DEM, which is taken from some, uh, which is taken from a variety of sources, uh, one of which is kind of a NASA survey of the, of the planet. There's also some radar, stroke lidar um, research that's going on that generates this digital elevation model. Of course, Google will never tell you how they actually generate it, right? Uh, but the problem with this model is um, it gives you a default viewing position in Google Earth Pro of between two and ten meters above the terrain. 
Now, in many locations, that doesn't matter, right? That really, really doesn't matter. And it probably only ever mattered in this one case study that I'm, that I'm talking to you about. But it's really worth thinking about that, you know, actually, if you're trying to compare a video, which, which you know, I'm 1 meter 96, and I never film, you know, I'm tall, and I never film like with another four centimeters or another meter above my head, um, that actually you're getting a distortion of the view in the Google Earth Pro model, right? Uh, it could be two meters, it could be as much as 10 meters above the terrain. Which, again, in this particular place where the terrain was so dramatic and varied so quickly was actually a really key part. The other problem is the height data information in Google Earth Pro is inaccurate in non or low data areas. So mountains, stroke deserts, but also in kind of areas where there's actually less supply and demand. So the amount of people looking at Google Earth Pro of New York City or the Pyrenees or the Alps is going to be very different from the amount of people looking at you know, a mountain range in northern Ethiopia. Uh, so, the, so there's even more inaccuracies there. So what we did was uh, we, we started to reconstruct the whole area uh, just to get away of the, from this confirmation anxiety. And we started with a high resolution satellite image. Uh, the, again, supply and demand means, you know, satellite imagery in Google Earth Pro in Northern Ethiopia and Tigray region, in the region of Tigray uh, is not regularly updated. The most recent satellite image we had of the area on Google Earth Pro, I think it was five or six years old. So we actually went out and purchased um, one of the more recent, the most recent satellite imagery, 30 centimeter resolution has satellite imagery that we could find. Uh, and we started from there to actually rebuild a whole model of the, of the area um, to actually reconstruct where the camera was. And let me just play this. And what we were able to do is then, by reconstructing the whole area, was really start to kind of get the camera down to human level, which kind of started taking away this confirmation anxiety uh, and allowed us to then actually map what we were seeing in the video, extracting changes that also Google Earth Pro wasn't able to give us in the field of view. So with taking away, thanks to the satellite image, you know, uh, mountains that were further in the background that kept distorting our vision, vision in Google Earth Pro, and start to create, so that's a bit of a loop, uh, start to create actually a, the model of the area where we could then take elements of what we were seeing in the video and map it to the satellite imagery. This is the satellite imagery. To really get away from the fact that, you know, there's no way that we can be attacked for being in the wrong place. So here you can see in the in in the in the reconstruction in the middle, uh, we have the frames from the video where you know we can map the 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 green uh, side of the landscape, for example. We can map the crevices or the the farming in the valley in red that you can see there, and we can map the um, we can map the blue, which is the kind of mountains in the background, and then exclude mountains that are further away. And then we we're able to take it a step further with the reconstruction and thanks to the, the satellite imagery and actually then place elements of foliage in the place, in the area. So can, then we could really go down into saying, okay, this bush is here, this bush is there, that bush is there. And then actually model it into saying, okay, then we know that if this bush is there and those bodies are there, we know exactly where this, where this happened, right? Um, so this is, some of the value of using uh, some technologies to actually go as far to really in human rights, and if we're talking about international law accountability and ever seeing anybody kind of in front of a court, in front of a court of law for doing this work, this is kind of the technological steps that we're starting to have to realize that we need to take to make this evidence of human rights abuses, to make this evidence of international human rights law abuses, sorry, international humanitarian law abuses, so the, war, the laws that cover war, absolutely unimpeachable. You know, it's getting harder for us to actually go to these locations. It's getting harder for journalists to go to these locations. You know, journalists, human rights investigators, researchers are becoming targets. So the importance of this evidence that, that comes from open source uh, information, open, open source sources is becoming more and more important. But it means also the attacks that we get for evidence are becoming even more and more harsh. Uh, you know, people want to avoid their their people want to avoid um, evidence like this. You know, the Ethiopian government shut down telecommunications for a reason to avoid these massacres, massacres coming to light. So we we're trying to use as much technology as we can now to make this the this evidence as we found find as unimpeachable as we can.
I'll stop there. Um, if anybody's interested more in it, I have the we have a little write up there. Thank you ever so much for sharing these really, really deep insights and letting us participate in what you do or what your team does when they come to investigating these cases. There's a number of questions, like one, maybe you can ask, uh, answer that separately, like Fiete Stegas asked, how did you insert the trees? Maybe you can uh, answer that directly. Um, just one question before we have our little break. Um, and you said that it took three people four days. That makes it 12 person days, which is an incredible lot to find a location. So this is also a question from the audience. Is location verification your core task or are there other areas that are very important and where you would require tools as well that support you? And then we have to go for our break. Sure. I mean, I think um, I think it really depends on the information you're trying to verify. Um, you know, I think in this case, yes, it was. I think we needed to know exactly which hilltop this happened on. I think we needed to know exactly where these people died. Um, I think you know, there's a variety of reasons for that. What well, number one, the world needs to know, but also you know, also part of our, our role as a human rights organization is to also help the victims and the families of the victims. You know achieve some some justice some closure some understanding of what happened to their to their loved ones um so in this case it was it's not always the case there's always there's sometimes other questions that need to be answered so we spend a lot of time working on weapons identification uh you know where is this weapon come from uh who sold this weapon to this country you know did they do it at a time when there was a weapons embargo in place we spend a lot of time doing that we spend a lot of time kind of going through satellite imagery to try and find helicopters um, we're doing that, you know, we've done that in, in all sorts of countries, like where did these helicopters come from? Can we find helicopters because there's a, there's a weapons embargo in this place that shouldn't be done. So it really depends on, on the kind of what we're, tr the, the, the question of fact that we're trying to prove. Uh, but very, uh, so geolocation is one of the, one of the main things we, we do. Yes, I would say. Okay. I'm afraid this is all we have time for, but this was absolutely fascinating. And thank you.